Howdy readers and howdy film buffs. I'm Jason, this is chapter and verse, and this is uh, my newest video in my best 21st century films I've seen series, uh, where I uh, look at the 980 some odd films I've seen released in America over the last two decades and count down my favorites uh, of those films from 100 to one. Um, I will uh, link in the description box below the introduction video to this series and the video uh, in which I covered uh, numbers 100 to 91. Uh, and in this video, I'm gonna be looking at uh, films number 90 through 81. So, without further ado, coming in on my list at number 90 is Blood Diamond uh, by Ed Zwick. Now, Ed Zwick um, is a filmmaker that I've been a fan of for quite some time. Um, I was a big, big fan of his movie Legends of the Fall, which came out in the kind of early to mid 90s. I want to say that was 94. Um, and, uh, and Blood Diamond uh, is one of those, it's one of those films that, that manages to shine a really important light on a social issue, with respect to this film, uh, The Diamond Trade, and manages to be entertaining as well at the same time, which is no mean feat. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio uh, stars in this, has the lead role, uh, co-stars Jaimin Hunsu and Jennifer Connelly. So I've always felt like DiCaprio's best performance was uh, What's Eating Gilbert Grape, right? When he was young, he was wiry, but as he's gotten older, uh, he's had really great kind of manly roles, really brawny roles, right? Um, the one that uh, he's, he's best known for, the one that he won the Oscar for, is uh, The Revenant, but uh, I think Blood Diamond is one of his uh, his best performances. His character is crafty, uh, he is haunted by conscience, and it's always great fun watching a character in a movie who is haunted by his or her conscience, uh, especially when uh, played by an actor as good as DiCaprio is. That's Blood Diamond by Ed Zwick. Uh, coming in at number 89 on my list, is The Shape of Water, uh, directed by Guillermo del Toro. Now, uh, one of the things I love so much about The Shape of Water, okay, is Sally Hawkins, right? She's been a favorite actress of mine for a very, very long time, and I think this is one of her best uh, performances. Uh, and back in, God, I think I wrote to her in 2009, I got my response, in uh, February of 2010, but I wrote her a fan letter, um, and she sent me she sent me uh, her picture, right, signed to me up at the top there. Um, it just says uh, with so much love, heart instead of love, Sally Hawkins. Thank you so much. But uh, but then she also wrote me a really nice card um, in which she talks about how she would love to star in. Uh, lots and lots of different adaptations uh, of books, including uh, books by William Trevor and George Eliot, uh, much to my wife's chagrin. Uh, many of you know that, that Kelly, uh, my wife, whose channel is uh, Books I'm Not Reading, hates George Eliot's Middlemarch. And uh, so when I went, just went downstairs and dug this, uh, this old card up that Sally Hawkins sent to me, um, you know, I reread it and because and, uh, it's been, you know, donkey's years since I'd looked at it. And then when I saw her mention George Eliot, Kelly sometimes feels like she can't escape George Eliot, which is funny. But uh, but back to The Shape of Water. So this uh, is directed by Guillermo del Toro, like I said. Uh, and del Toro is best known for um, just monster movies, right? I mean, he loves making not not what you would call horror films, but um, but when you watch a del Toro picture, um, there's there's something very 1950s monster movie about his films and of all of his films that I've seen this is the one that most harkens back to those movies that were uh, his great inspiration right uh, that that kind of took his fevered imagination and uh, and helped give it shape uh, as far as storytelling was concerned and um, aesthetics and, and, and what have you uh, this movie is about a mute cleaning lady at a government installation during the Cold War uh, here in the States. And, um, and at this government uh, installation, they are 
housing, housing, tanking, <laughs> they're keeping and studying on torturing a merman uh, that was captured, I think, somewhere in South America. And, uh, and anyhow, it is a love story between this cleaning lady and this merman. Uh, and as you can see there, there are the two of them embracing. But um, yeah, it is, it is a movie that harkens back to those uh, old films like Creature from the Black Lagoon, what have you. It's a kind of cocktail of uh, whimsy and nostalgia, uh, brutality. There are some incredibly violent uh, scenes in the film. Uh, one particularly violent character played by Michael Shannon. Um, the film also reminds me a little bit of Amelie, actually. Um, there's, um, there's a, a character in the movie played by Richard Jenkins. And for those of you who've seen Amelie, but who haven't seen The Shape of Water, Richard Jenkins' character's, uh, storyline and personality reminded me a lot of the glass man who lives in Amelie's building in Amelie. Um, so that was another thing working for it. There's also a kind of nod to Delicatessen in this film as well. And, uh, and which makes sense, I suppose, now that I'm talking about Amelie, uh, because Amelie was directed by Jean-Pierre Genet, and Delicatessen was co-directed by Jean-Pierre uh, Jean Genet. So, um, there's a little bit of a stain on this film, a little bit of a scandal surrounding it. So, uh, there were cries of plagiarism uh, with The Shape of Water. Uh, I read quite a bit about it when it was uh, first happening. So, Del Toro had a writing partner on this film. And I can't remember if he actually co-wrote the screenplay with Del Toro or if um, he just kind of co-came up with the story. Uh, but regardless, the the plagiarism accusations, to my mind, actually do hold water. Uh, but it, it seems to me, it seems to me that, that Del Toro himself was unaware of this and that the guy, his, his writing partner, his kind of, you know, idea conceiving partner, um, brought this this material to the table and um, was kind of passing these ideas off as his own uh, because the, the plagiarism accusation has to do with a, a deeply obscure play from ages ago. And I just, I just can't imagine that Del Toro um, was familiar with this thing. Um, but everything I've read about it seems to suggest that Del Toro is in the clear as far as that goes. Um, but if I remember, I will, I will try to leave a link to, uh, to an, you know, one or two articles dealing with that plagiarism scandal surrounding The Shape of Water. So that's number 89. And number 88 is Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Um, which was co-directed by Joel and Ethan Cohen. So, most of you, I'm sure, have seen this. Uh, this tells the story of three men on a jailbreak and how one of those men is looking to um, to find, to reconnect with his family. Uh, and that guy is played by uh, George Clooney. Um, George Clooney, who is a Dapper Dan man. He doesn't want Fop, goddammit. He wants Dapper Dan. Um, it's zany. It's episodic. Um, it's really a lark. Uh, and it is loosely based on Homer's uh, The Odyssey. I have not read The Odyssey, which I think I've confessed to once before on this channel, but in case uh, some of you watching had not seen that confession prior and didn't know that I had never read The Odyssey, um, be still your heart, compose yourself. Maybe this coming year. Um, yeah, I've never really been one for the classics, right? Like the, the old uh, classics that are so big with my friend Lukash here on book two. This has one of the best curated soundtracks of all time. Um, and it's just incredibly funny. I mean, I was just thinking about scenes from this movie today. And maybe it's because I've got some hillbilly in me as well uh, that, I, that I love this movie so much. I saw it in the cinema when it came out and um, with my brother and I think, I think with my old theater instructor, I think. Um, and, uh, and for some reason, I mean, I mean, let me know what your experience of this film has been, but, but I mean, there were a decent number of people in the theater when we saw this, and we were the only ones laughing. Uh, we were laughing hard. Um, yeah, all I have to do is just think of certain lines or certain scenes or moments in this film, and, uh, and I just, I have a difficult time keeping it together. Um, today I was thinking of uh, where they meet up with the sirens at the river, and um, 
Yeah, and uh, and uh, I don't remember like where John Turturro has gone to. What like, what happens? But his clothes are there, and um, and there's a there's a frog inside of his clothes, and Tim Blake Nelson, who's the dimmest of the characters, which is saying a lot because none of them is terribly bright. Um, yeah, he sees the frog hop out of the shirt, and uh, yeah, says something like, you know, him sirens loved him up and turned him into a horny toad, and it's just it's just wonderful. Oh, brother, where art thou? Uh, let's see, number eighty-seven. This is AI, Artificial Intelligence, uh, directed by Steven Spielberg. Um, so this tells the story simply. Well, it's not simple at all, but the, the story itself is, is like a fairy tale, uh, basic in the way that a fairy tale is, is basic. Uh, just tells the story of a child robot on a quest to be accepted. Um, now this movie, okay, right, this idea, the kernel of this film, was a project of Stanley Kubrick's for a very, very long time. And uh, upon Kubrick's death, Kubrick sort of bequeathed the project, the idea, to Steven Spielberg. And uh, Spielberg, um, I don't know if he had Kubrick's screenplay to work from or what have you, but Spielberg either, you know, rewrote what Kubrick had written or just, you know, took Kubrick's ideas and wrote his own script, which is one of the cool things about this movie because Spielberg hardly ever writes screenplays. I think the last time he'd written a screenplay for one of his films prior to this was, I want to say Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Uh, but, so a lot of people, when this came out, were wary of it, were suspicious of it, right? Because Kubrick's sensibility as a filmmaker was, uh, was very clinical, was very cold, very icy. And as we all know, Spielberg um, is a filmmaker who's often accused of being kind of saccharine, um, or people often say that it's some have a kind of manufactured warmth to them. So their sensibilities would seem to be at odds. And as a result, when this came out, um, a lot of critics, most critics, thought the end of this film was kind of typically Spielberg. They thought the end of this film was, uh, was saccharine, was hallmarky. Um, and I parted ways with, with, the majority of critics on that completely. I actually find the, the ending of this film incredibly bleak, just incredibly bleak. Um, and from the first time I saw it, I, I remember I had just very clear ideas about my interpretation of the ending of this thing. And I was reading reviews one day and I came across the review of A.O. Scott, who was, I think even then, writing in the New York Times. I had never read anything by A.O. Scott before. And A.O. Scott's interpretation of the ending of AI was exactly my interpretation. And at that moment, he became my favorite critic. Not because he agreed with me, um, but because his sensibility was revealed as being um, very much in line with my own. Uh, and, and even now, I mean, A.O. Scott is the critic uh, with whom I, I agree most often, I think. He is one of the very best film critics working today. And, uh, and I understood or recognized, saw his genius uh, when he saw the same genius that I saw in this film, um, which I just realized is making me sound like I think I'm a genius. I'm not saying that at all about myself, but, but AI is just magnificent. Uh, Haley Joel Osment from The Sixth Sense stars as the little robot boy. Uh, Jude Law stars as a kind of robot Gigolo, um, I think his name in the film is actually Gigolo Joe, uh, but yeah, he has this kind of, uh, Steve would say, uh, this kind of Timothy Chalamet sort of falseness about the way he looks, right? Like there are no pores in his skin or what have you. Um, but, but yeah, this movie is, uh, it's incredibly dark. It's incredibly sad. And, um, and it's one of Spielberg's uh, best films and maybe his most misunderstood film, actually. So, AI. Let's see. All right, so the next film I don't actually have yet. I've ordered it, um, but it didn't arrive in time for the making of this video. So uh, I will put uh, a little picture of it up right here. Uh, and that is Drive, right? Number 86 is Drive, uh, by, directed by uh, Nicholas Winding Rafen. Um, one might also say uh, directed by a 
major asshole. Um, because that's the thing I knew about this director before seeing Drive, which was just recently. I only watched it for the first time a few weeks ago. Um, and and I, I think part of the reason why I had never seen it was because everything I'd ever heard about Nicholas Winding Rafen or read about him, um, everybody who meets the guy seems to think that he is just a massive prick. And, uh, and I'm not terribly keen on seeing films by, by filmmakers who just don't treat interviewers well, don't treat their casts well. Um, yeah, I have gripes about David O. Russell uh, as far as that goes, too. But, um, but anyway, I, I watch a movie every week with my friend Ben, who lives in Scotland, and then we get together on Zoom on the weekends and talk about it. We take turns choosing the films. And uh, Drive was a choice of his. And I watched it. I had a day off work and I watched it one morning um, and it was so good I watched it again that night and I can't remember the last time I did that where I liked the film so much I watched it twice in one day. Uh, Drive is about a stunt driver in Hollywood uh, who also works as a mechanic and he moonlights as a getaway driver on heists and um, it's marvelous from the very beginning from the, I mean, the, the very opening sequence, from the opening titles, that kind of hot pink of uh, the opening titles that suggests something like Miami Vice from the 80s. The soundtrack, it's this kind of electronic pop thing going on, the fusion of that soundtrack with, um, you know, this idea of looking at Los Angeles as a, as a kind of dreamscape, right? Um, I just fell in love with this thing, uh, with the aesthetic of it, with the tone, the vibe of the thing. One of the things that I like so much about it is how how it kind of functions as a callback to one of my favorite films of all time, which is Heat, directed by Michael Mann. It came out in the mid '90s, um, and it's not only you know how Mann filmed Los Angeles in that movie. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of echoed in in some of the ways that uh, that, that Nicholas Winding Rafen films Los Angeles in this film, but um, the main character. Okay, in Heat, uh, is a is a criminal, um, you know, a career criminal who uh, robs banks and um, is very, very good at what he does. And he has this ethos that he lives by, uh, which is basically that you can't allow anything in your life that you wouldn't be willing to walk out on uh, in 15 seconds flat, right, if you smell the heat around the corner. Um, you know, essentially, basically, I mean, you can't have connections with people because it gets you in trouble. Um, it makes you second guess yourself. Um, you, your priorities as, as a criminal get all screwed up and get all wonky. And, um, and the character in, in Drive, played by Ryan Gosling, uh, has much the same thing, right? He's, he lives this kind of monastic life, right? I mean, he barely talks. Um, he's never you know, with anybody except for his boss at the garage. Um, and uh, he just hires himself out in this very precise clinical way that leaves very little room for error to these guys who, who want to pull heists. And, um, and he meets them at the place where it's going to happen and um, gets them away from the place once it's happened and then he vanishes. He never sees them again. It's only when he allows somebody into his life, when he makes a connection, that things start to get messy for him. And, uh, and Drive is just beautiful, man. It's exhilarating. It's intoxicating. Um, this is a hell of a movie. I can't wait for my Blu-ray to get here. Number 85 on my list is Apocalypto, directed by Mel Gibson. All right, so we all know Mel Gibson's crazy. Okay, that goes without saying. Um, I'm not even going to go into the plot of this thing because the plot of Apocalypto is beside the point. Um, when you watch a film... Apart from Man Without a Face, when you watch a film that Mel Gibson has directed, you're expecting one thing, right? You're expecting just a lot of kind of, you know, fever dream brutality. You get that in Braveheart. You get it much more in The Passion of the Christ. You get it much more in this. Uh, and even in Hacksaw Ridge. I mean, Mel Gibson is a kind of, he's kind of a poet of violence, I, I suppose we might say. Um, and this, this might be... His best film? Um, yeah, and I mean, as you can see, right, so I'll give you a close look at the pictures there. Um, 
we are uh, headed back to uh, to Mayan culture um, in Central America uh, many 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 centuries ago and uh, and the thing is um, yeah it's 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 shot in um, uh, in the Mayan language right so it's got subtitles and the thing is just crazy uh, it's just bananas so like that scene from X-Men Days of Future Past Apocalypto as a whole feels like cinema as a drug, right? It feels, um, it feels like pure adrenaline when you're watching it. You feel exhausted by the end of it in a good way. Uh, and it is, yeah, man, it's just, it's an ambitious, it, it could really only be the work of a madman. Um, but the thing is ambitious to the nth degree. Um, more filmmakers should have the kind of vision that Mel Gibson does. I mean, he won an Oscar for directing Braveheart, but Apocalypto, I, I think, is a better film uh, than Braveheart. <sighs> Number 84, and this is um, possibly the most obscure movie um, that I'll be talking about in this video, and that is Heaven, which stars Kate Blanchett and Giovanni Ribisi, and it's directed by Tom Tiefer, who directed uh, Run, Lola, Run, and The Princess and the Warrior, uh, co-directed Cloud Atlas, um, and the thing is, right, so this came out in, what was it, 2002, um, the screenplay for this was co-written by Krzysztof Kieslowski and uh, Krzysztof, uh, well, let's see if I get his name right here, uh, Pizievich, uh, who was Kieslowski's writing partner uh, through, I mean, at least his latter career before he died. Uh, they co-wrote the Three Color Stones together. They co-wrote uh, The Double Life of Veronique. And Heaven was to be the first film in another trilogy. Um, Kieslowski was going to make three films, Heaven, Hell, and Purgatory. And, uh, and he died before, uh, before he could. And, um, and Tiefer came on board and directed um, Kieslowski's screenplay. And it's magnificent. So at the very beginning of the film, we see Kate Blanchett. We don't know who she is. Okay. We see her making a bomb, and then we see her uh, going to police headquarters and planting that bomb in the office of a specific man. Suffice it to say, uh, things don't go as planned. And the film um, then becomes a kind of ethical puzzle or conundrum, right? It's a movie that explores the tensions between uh, justice and regret uh, between vengeance and grace. Yeah, you know, I, Kate Blanchett's won a couple of Oscars. She won an Oscar for The Aviator. She won an Oscar for, I think it's called Blue Jasmine, the Woody Allen film. And she's good in both of those movies, really, really good. But her best performances are Oscar Lucinda and Elizabeth. And, uh, and I would say Heaven. Uh, her performance in Heaven is, is right up there. Uh, let's see, number 83. On my list is Batman Begins, uh, directed by Christopher Nolan. Now, Christopher Nolan is a director I have a lot of problems with. Uh, Christopher Nolan tends, I don't and I don't understand why this is, but he's a filmmaker who tends to kind of disappear up his own ass. And, um, you know, he, his ideas for most of his films, uh, are never quite as cool as he thinks they are. Um, he is served much better, in my opinion, um, by linear narrative, by, by just good, solid, foundational, straightforward storytelling. And that's what Batman Begins is, right? Um, it's an origin story, essentially. Um, but I mean, if you look at Nolan's other films as well, right, Insomnia is one of his best, best movies. It doesn't mess around. It doesn't futz around with timelines or anything like this. Um, yeah, don't even get me started on Inception. Don't even get me started on that. But uh, my favorite scene in this movie... So in my previous video, I had talked to you guys. I had mentioned that when Kelly and I see movies in the theater, and if I'm really into the film, like if I'm just lost in it, um, that I'll start doing this thing that I'm unconscious of, but that she notices where I almost kind of start levitating out of my seat a little bit. And there's a scene in Batman Begins that did this to me. And I wasn't particularly excited about seeing this in the theater. If I remember right, um, Kelly wanted to see this more than I did. And, uh, but it was during this scene in the, in the film where I was just, I was sold, I was hooked. Uh, and it's the scene where 
Bruce Wayne goes into the Batcave to uh, to essentially conquer his fear. And uh, he knows that the bats are going to come down there. They're going to swarm him. There's going to be thousands of them. And um, and he needs to conquer his fear. And uh, and we see him essentially just kind of cowering, acting like any of us might, I suppose, uh, being swarmed with bats. But then, I mean, he just, a little bit like Russell Crowe's face in that scene I talked about from Gladiator last, last week. Um, he just kind of resolves himself, right? He masters it. He masters what has been uh, hindering him, what has been chilling him, what has been preventing him from becoming who he needs to be. And that scene is the best thing in the film. Number 82 is Gravity, directed by Alfonso Cuaron. Uh, I, again, most of you have probably seen this movie. The plot is simple. It's about an astronaut in peril. Um, so, like Apocalypto, um, this film is just... It's just a jolt, it's just a mainline jolt of adrenaline. A little bit about me. So this is an irrational fear, admittedly. Uh, but my my greatest fear, the thing that, that, that you know breaks me out in the, the cold sweat whenever I just even think about it, uh, long before I saw this movie, is the idea of drifting out into space, right? Dying by drifting out into space, being just completely detached and nobody can hear you scream, nobody can do anything for you and uh, you'll essentially just suffocate out there eventually. But just that void just terrifies me and there's a scene in this where Sandra Bullock's character goes what they call off structure and, uh, and she's tumbling out into space and she can't grab onto anything, she can't maneuver herself, she doesn't have her bearings, she's panicking, she's hyperventilating. We see um, the, the shot from her point of view. She's just tumbling head over heels, right, out there in the, in the void. And, uh, and that scene in the movie, and I think I saw it in 3D when it came out, which made it even worse, uh, better, worse uh, for my anxiety. But, uh, but that scene made me physically wretch in, in the theater. I, I mean, I, I physically just gagged, right? I mean, just came almost out of my seat. And, uh, and, and that's how good it is. Uh, Alfonso Cuaron, he just puts you there uh, in this place that is so exquisitely beautiful, but so absolutely unconditionally terrifying at the same time. Um, and my favorite thing about the film, and I won't reveal too much about the movie, but um, my favorite thing about the film is how by the very, very end of the movie, we come to realize that the film is kind of a compression of the theory of evolution, right? Uh, this idea that everything we are, right, um, is the result, not the end result, because we're still growing, we're still changing, we're still evolving. Uh, not the, so not the end result, but everything that is, is the result of something that came from the heavens, okay? Uh, that we are literally stardust. Um, yeah, and, and the way the film takes that idea and, um, I don't know, and kind of just puts it in a nutshell and then explodes it uh, with the ending. It's, it's just uh, magnificent. And then the last movie uh, in this video that I want to talk about is a film I'm actually not going to talk about because I've made a very long video about it in the past. Uh, and that is The Widow of St. Pierre, directed by Patrice Leconte and starring uh, Juliette Binoche and Daniel Atui. And... Uh, yeah, it's it's marvelous, man. I mean, the, the film is it's just sublime. It's just perfection. Um, so instead of talking about it, uh, what I'll do is I will leave a link in the description box below to my video on it, which I think was like 20 minutes long. So it's 20 minutes of me talking about The Widow of St. Pierre. So um, if you're curious to learn more about this movie, um, you can check that video out. But... That's it. Um, yeah, let me know in the in the comments below which of these films you guys have seen, uh, what you think of them, uh, which of those you haven't seen but you're now intrigued to see. I'll be curious to know that as well. And join me next week when we look at uh, my films uh, numbers 80 through 71 in this uh, little film series of mine. So... But that's it for this one. Uh, I look forward to chatting with you guys in the comments below. 
and uh, you will see me again very soon. Adios.